All right, now in Isaiah chapter 9, here, obviously, before I get started with Isaiah chapter 9, you know, this Christmas, this service, what I want to do is I want to bring some honor unto our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, by telling the story a little bit about who he was and what he did. I know it's a very familiar story, but um, hopefully some of you could get some more things out of it tonight that's, that's a little bit more than just maybe what you commonly hear and, and um, have come and heard about Jesus Christ because he did a lot for us and, and the gift that he made available for us today is tremendous. And obviously, I mean, that's, that's the whole purpose of Christmas is, and, and what I want to do tonight is to just, is to just um, you know, shed some light on that and to honor that and respect that and, and give Jesus his due time today. Because, I mean, this is the day it's supposed to be all about Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not about the presents. It's not about Santa Claus. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about what Jesus did for us. And we're going to take the time tonight to just look back a little bit um, about who Jesus was, what he did, and, um, and the gift that's available for us. So here in Isaiah chapter 9, you can see in verse number 6, um, this, is a, this is a prophecy about Jesus Christ to come in the Old Testament. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And I think, and this is, this is referring to Jesus Christ that's going to be born, God in the flesh. And we can see that um, by these names. It says, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. See, this is a great verse to prove, one of many, to prove that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. God himself, God the creator of heaven and earth, the sea and all that in him is. God <coughs> created everything, became a man. God took on the form of a man and of a servant when he was born through Jesus Christ. And that's why it says his name is going to be the mighty God. The everlasting father was, was born a man in this world. Go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 22. It's just a little bit, a little bit back in your Bible from where you're at in Isaiah. See, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us, it says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Again, another, another scripture, another verse, and that one from the New Testament explaining that God was manifest in the flesh. God was, was made known to us in the flesh. <clears throat> Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Now, there's a lot of people who don't believe that today. But there's, there's very, I mean, those are two very clear scriptures that just flat out say, hey, his son's going to be born, his name is going to, he's going to be the everlasting father. Okay, he is the mighty God. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16 that God was manifest, manifest in the flesh. John 1.1 1, 1 says, um, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And then later on in John 1, it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So oh, many, many places in the Bible we see that, you know, Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. God is a human being. And that in itself is an amazing thing. It's a, it's a miraculous thing. And it's the reason why, you know, some 2,000 years later, we still observe, you know, our time is based off of, off of, his, um, off of his death and his, uh, and his resurrection. And, um, <clears throat> you know, our time is just based around Jesus Christ himself. And we're still celebrating, you know, his birth. And we're celebrating and recognizing Jesus Christ today. And there's so many people that are Christians and that follow Christ because he was God in the flesh. It's an important event, obviously. Now, Psalm 22, we're going to see a little bit about the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ did a lot for us. And we again, I want to take some time to recognize all the things that we did. Because normally, if you just think, if someone's talking about Jesus and you just think about, um, you know, the first thought that's going to come to your mind is probably just going to be, hey, he's a real loving guy. And he was. You know, he did a lot of great miracles. Absolutely. You're, you're probably going to be thinking, though, about the positive, nice, good things that Jesus did. That's going to be the first thing that comes to mind. But he did so much for us and so much more. And it's not necessarily pleasant, but it's, but it's good for us to hear and look at because he did a lot for us. Look at Psalm 22. Look at verse number 6 because this is, again, this is the prophecy of Jesus Christ. And this is all describing what he went through and what he did for us um, at, when he became a man. To, to bear our sins. Look at verse number six. It says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. This is what Jesus Christ was going through. He called himself a worm, a reproach. He is despised. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head. 
saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And you can see in the New Testament, that's exactly what happened. When they nailed Jesus Christ to the cross, the people were mocking him and ridiculing him and saying, Oh yeah, he trusted in God. Let God save him now if he really be the Son of God. You know, they were just saying all this stuff. It is exactly what was prophesied here in Psalm 22. Verse number 9 says, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that is melted in the midst of my bowels. When he was hanging up on that cross, basically, he was so exhausted, he was just poured out. He was poured out like water. All of his bones were out of joint just from hanging up there on that cross. The amount of weight, his own body weight and gravity is pulling down on him, and, and the pain and the suffering that he was going through. Verse 15 says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. I mean, he's, he's, he's done. You know, he's, he's, he's got no more strength left. He's poured out like water. It says, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And now it's brought me into the dust of death. <coughs> he's so thirsty, right, his, that his mouth is just completely dry. And his tongue is just sticking to the top of his mouth. His strength is dried up. Verse number 16 says, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lot upon my vesture. I mean, make this real. Think about what he had to go through. They, they put nails through his hands and his feet. It says he could, when he says I can tell my bones, that word tell means like when you go to a bank teller, it's, it's a little bit of an older word that's not quite much used today, but I mean, you go to a bank, a bank teller. The reason why they're called a teller is because they're able, they count the money, right? They're able to count it. So what he was saying that when he could tell all his bones, he could count them. And the reason why he could count his bones, it says because they look and stare upon me. The reason why is because he was beat so bad. Jesus Christ was beat. He was whipped with a whip. He, he was whipped so hard, it cut through his body where he could see his own bones, this is the suffering that Jesus Christ went through. Okay, he went through a lot for us. And a lot of times, like I said, when we think about Jesus Christ, and understandably so, I mean, it's not the first thing you're going to think of. It's not the first thing I think of. But why want to take the time to recognize what he did for us? Because everything that he did here, everything that he went through, it was for you. It was for me. It was for everybody in the entire world. He did all of this stuff. He allowed this stuff to happen. The just for the unjust. And I, you don't have to turn there. Isaiah 52 says... Um, Verse 13, again, just explaining a little bit more about what Jesus went through and, and what he looked like at that time. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Now, his visage means what he looked like, like visually. What he looked like, his, his form, what he looked like, it was marred, it was beat up, it was bloody. More than any man. So he just looked like, like it was hard to even, even look at him and think that he was a man because he was just so beat up and bloodied and what they had done to him and what he had gone through and the sufferings that he went through. Now, Jesus did not deserve to be punished. You guys are in, um, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2 if you would. I'm going to read for you from 1 Peter chapter 2. Because of all people on the earth, of all the sinners of everyone on the earth that deserves to be punished, Jesus did not deserve to be punished in any way, shape, or form. Now, you or I, you can find a way to say, well, if we were to get punished, we're sinners. Okay, we've done things that are wrong. We could probably, you know, you could find some justification for us to be punished. And, of course, that's true. I mean, God has the punishment of hell on our sins. So, there is a just punishment that we would deserve because of what we've done wrong. But Jesus, see, Jesus Christ didn't sin. And it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, you're in Acts chapter 2, but in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, 
Neither was guile found in his mouth. So the Bible tells us right here, Jesus did not sin. He did no sin. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. And when it says stripes there again, that's referring to his whippings and his beatings because when he got whipped with the whip, it left a bloody stripe, a mark going down that was, that was you know, he was bleeding and, and that's how bad they beat him. And it says his, his own self, he bare our sins in his own body when he was up on that cross. So when Jesus Christ came, he allowed it, I mean, he got whipped, he got beat up. They did more than that too. In the New Testament, we're, we're, I'm not going to go there for sake of time in my notes, but I mean, they mocked him. They stripped his clothes off of him. They put this purple robe on him, thinking, "Oh yeah, you're the king, right? You're you're some 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 king." We're gonna and they mocked him. They made a crown, but it's a crown of thorns, and they put that crown of thorns on his head. And then they beat him with a rod. It says afterwards they they beat him with a reed on on top of his head after he's already had that crown of thorns on his head. People spit on him. They covered his face. They they punched him and said, "Oh, prophesy! Who is that 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 just hit you?" You know, just mocking him and making fun of him. Oh, you're a prophet? Yeah, tell us, tell us who just hit you then. And this is the Son of God. This is God incarnate. God in the flesh. And this is how he was treated when he came to this earth. By many people that rejected him and, and beat him up and bloody him and spit on him and mocked him. And again, I mean, spitting on him, you can think, oh, that's not that bad. Have you ever been spit on before? Has anyone ever spit in your face? That is like one of the most humiliating, that is the most enraging thing, especially for a man. Like, if someone were to come up to you and spit in your face, that makes my blood, that would make my blood boil in an instant. I mean, that is, that is something, I mean, you just don't do that. And, and that is so degrading and so disrespectful, and that's how they treated him. That's how they thought of him. And this is God in the flesh, but he, he allowed all of this, this is amazing, he allowed everything to happen. He suffered it. He took it. He took the shame. And the reason why he did all that, he took that for us. You see, we're the ones that would deserve that punishment. But he allowed all this to happen so he can bear our sins in his own body. He did not deserve the punishment, but he came and took that punishment to take it in our place. We would be the ones that would deserve the, the punishment of the cross or deserve any, any type of, of punishment like that. He came and took it for us. Now, his sufferings didn't end when he died up on that cross. You're in Acts chapter 2. Look down at verse number 25 of Acts chapter 2. Because, that, I mean, that alone is a lot. He went through a tremendous amount of pain and suffering and torture and torment and ridicule and mockings. But that's not where it ends. Look at verse number 25 of Acts 2. It says, For David speaketh concerning him. He's talking about the, you know, the prophet David, King David. In the book of Psalms here, it says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now what's happening here, this is the Apostle Peter. He's preaching, and he is saying here, he's quoting the Old Testament. He's saying, you know, the prophet David said this, and, he's, and he, so he quotes the Old Testament, he quotes the book of Psalms, and then he explains what that scripture is about in verse 29 of Acts chapter 2. He says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So he's saying, look, it's not about David. David wasn't saying this of, about himself. He wasn't saying, you know, like writing this down, the scripture isn't pertaining specifically to David. Because he's, he's saying, look, he's dead, he's buried, and his sepulcher, sepulcher is still here today. He says, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up where we all are witnesses. So he's saying, look, Peter's explained that scripture that he just read for, about David, that wasn't about David. That was about Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell. Because you see, after Jesus Christ died on the cross, as he was burying our sins, his soul descended into hell for three days and three nights. That's what he was doing 
when after they buried his body in a tomb, but his soul was in hell. He bare our sins in his own body. He had our sins, and, and this, you know, the punishment for our sins is hell. And it makes sense that if Jesus came to pay the punishment for our sins, he also paid for them in hell. Now, but glory to God, the resurrection, right? Jesus conquered death and hell. He paid the punishment. He did what he had to do, but then he was, he, he was raised again from the dead. He came back to life. Now go ahead and turn to Romans 5, if you will. It's going to be a little bit of a shorter sermon today. We're going to wrap things up in a little bit. But Romans chapter 5. So what's the result of all this? Basically, God has paid for a gift. Okay, Jesus Christ went through a lot. And let's not lose sight of that. That's why we went through all these scriptures. And this is just a small sampling of the scriptures. There's a lot more in the New Testament that goes over, you know, in more detail what Jesus Christ went through and the things that he did for us. But I don't want to lose sight of that because he did all of that to pay for a gift. And that makes that gift extremely precious. It's extremely valuable. And this gift is referred to many times in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5 here specifically. It talks about this free gift. Because that's one of the things we do on Christmas is we exchange gifts. And there's a gift tonight that if, that if you don't already have this gift, I would like you to have this gift. But we're going to read a little bit in Romans chapter 5 about it. Look at verse number 15 of Romans 5. It says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offenses of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we notice there, you keep on saying, he's not saying the gift, the gift, the free gift, the gift. And this is extremely important to understand because this is one of the things that I think it's a concept that people don't quite get about salvation. And it's an extremely important concept. A lot of people, will, they say they, 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 they believe that. They'll say that, it, that they believe salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. But I think a lot of people don't quite grasp just how free and how complete that gift is. Now, who here likes to receive a gift? I know I do. Is there anyone that doesn't like to receive a gift? I think everyone likes to receive gifts, right? Now, there's the reason why, you know, the Bible uses this word gift a lot. It uses it a lot in this chapter and in other places, too. The Bible talks about a gift. And it's not a mistake that it uses that word, okay? Let's, let's just analyze a gift real briefly. Okay, a gift is something, you know, I'm going to, Sebastian, you mind coming up here real quick? I'm going to use you for my illustration. Okay. I'm gonna, we're going to use an example of giving a gift, right? You just stand right over here. Okay. Let's say here's Sebastian. And I go, Sebastian, I want to give you this Bible for a gift. Okay. It's a pretty nice Bible. You know, I got it um, online. It's probably about 50 bucks. But um, I want to give this to you. I need you to give me a dollar. Is that a gift? No. No. Of course not. You're paying for it. What if I said, okay. You know what? No money. I don't want you to have to buy it. I'm going to give you this Bible, but first you're going to have to go out and wash my car. Is that a gift? Mm -hmm. No. That might be a good deal. I mean, it might, it, might, it might be worthwhile. It might be something you want to do, but that's not a gift. I mean, by definition, it's not a gift. A gift has to be something that, hey, you know what? This is free. I want you to have this. So let's say I go, okay. No, oh, let me ask you this. Let's say, you know what? No money, nothing, no strings attached. I, I just want you to have this for a gift. Do you have to accept it? No. No. Of course not. You can say, no thanks. I don't want that. But let's say you accept it. Go ahead and take it. Now once I give him the gift, who does it belong to? It belongs to him. Yeah, it's his. Would it be right for me, let's say, let's say a week goes by and 
and I hear this this, this dirty Sebastian's out there, and he's <laughs> he's spreading rumors. And he's saying, "Man, that Pastor Burzens, he's like, he has one thing. You see him on Sunday, but you should see him during the week. That guy's out. He's he's out boozing it up and doing all these things." And I go, "You know what? I heard you lying about me. Give me that back." <laughs> now, would that be right? It might seem, you might be like, you know what, you shouldn't have been saying those things. But here's the thing, once I give him a gift, like if this is truly a gift, you go ahead and have a seat. Once I give him a gift, it belongs to him, right? I mean, the ownership has changed. If I were to take it back just because I didn't like something he said or something he did, right, then I'd be stealing it. I mean, I'd just, I'd just be stealing it back from him. I, it, it wouldn't have been a gift in the first place. And if he had to be good, if he had to do right, if he had to do all these things in order to, to maintain and retain that gift I gave him, that's not really a gift. A gift is something you give it to someone one time and it's theirs. Okay? And this is what's so important about salvation because the thing with salvation is a lot of people don't get this, but it's really important. I want you all to, 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 to let it sink in because salvation is a gift. The Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life. Okay? Now, if it's truly a gift, then it's not something that you work for. It's not something you have to obey the commandments in order to receive because God's just offering. He says, you know what? I bought this. I paid for it. I want you to have it. Now, a lot of people these days just say, no thanks. I don't want it. Some people think, well, I'm just going to go and try to buy my own. I'm going to buy my own way in heaven. I'm going to work my own way there. I'm going to live the most righteous life, and I don't need what Jesus did for me. That's what some people think they're going to do. Or they think that, well, I've done way more good than I've done bad. So I deserve to go into heaven. But the problem with that thing is that we don't deserve to go to heaven. We're all sinners. We all have a debt. We all have, we all have done wrong. We've all, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. We deserve hell. But Jesus Christ has paid for, our, for our, our way into heaven. He's paid for our sins. He paid for every single one of them when he died up on that cross. And it's a gift. It's a free gift. There's no strings attached with this. All you have to do is receive it. Now, with Sebastian, with the, with the illustration of the Bible... All he had to do was reach out his hand and, and take it. Now, with eternal life, we can't physically reach our hands up to heaven and, and accept that gift. It's not, it's not a physical, tangible thing. It's eternal life. It's something that's inside of us. So the way that we do that, as in Acts 16, it says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The way that we receive that gift from God is putting our faith in Christ. Once we do that, that gift, that is the, that is the action of us reaching our hand and taking that gift. When we put our faith in Christ and say, you know what? He's my Savior. I want Jesus to save me. I'm trusting on Him to save me. That's when you receive that gift. And then I tell you what, that gift, as true as God's Word is, as true as God is to His Word, it's eternal. That gift lasts you forever. And that is an amazing gift. I mean, this, this, this physical book I have in my hand, or I give him another book, it doesn't matter... I mean, this, this will eventually perish. It's going to get old and it's going to you know, decay and rot and whatever. It could get burned up, whatever. But eternal life, you can never lose it. It's eternal. It's, it's, it's something that's with you forever. And, a lot, and, and this is what I think a lot of people don't get because they'll think that like, well, yeah, you just have to believe in Christ to be saved. But if you were to go out and murder someone, if you were to go out and do something else that's really bad, well, yeah, God's going to take it away from you. I mean, you're going to go to hell. That's not true. If you had to obey the commandments in order to keep that gift, I mean, even the worst commandment, right? Even, even the, the biggest sins, if you had to obey the law, then that's not, that wasn't really a gift. That was more of like, well, you do this, this, and this, and I'll give you this. That was more like you earning it. That was more of you, you know, obeying all these things in order, in order to, to receive that. And it's not, that's no longer a gift. That would be a contract, that would be something else, but, it would, but you couldn't call that just a free gift or something that's just, here you go, I want you to have this. And here's the thing, okay, with gifts, and I'm just going to put this in here real quick because we don't have anything to do with Santa Claus in this house because of that, con one of the reasons specifically is because of that concept of a gift. And what they teach, you know, this idea of with Santa Claus... And, and giving and receiving gifts at Christmas, they've totally perverted the meaning of a gift. Because what happens? They tell kids, you better be good, right? Santa's watching you, and if you're not good, you're not going to get any gifts. So you better be a really good child and just make sure that you're on your best behavior because if you're not, then you're not going to receive gifts from Santa, from this guy that 
somehow can just see and hear and know everything. You know, <clears throat> sounds a little bit like God to me. But that just perverts what a gift is all about. And I don't want my children to have a false sense of what a gift is about. You see, they get gifts from their parents and from other people because people love them and they want them. Hey, I want you to have something nice and this is yours. And it doesn't matter whether you are good or bad. If I want to give you a gift, that's yours and that's your gift. And, they're, and that's, they own that. That's theirs. Now, it's not something you earn by obeying and being a good child. Now, maybe if they're good, they might end up getting more gifts just in general because Hey, I love them and I want to bless them more. I want to give them more things. They've, they've been great. They've been, they've been a blessing to me. But that's not the, it's not the same as you have to be good in order to receive this gift. And that's a perversion. And that's just a little side note of this, of this sermon. But it's kind of important that we understand, you know, what is a gift? It has nothing to do with being good or bad. It's something that you just received out of love. And this is a gift that's given out of love. It's unconditional. The only thing required of the person is, is just to receive it. Like, that's the only condition of a gift is just someone has to receive it, right? <clears throat> and it's no different with the gift of God. God loves us. God has a gift for us. And all we have to do is accept it, and it's ours. And his gift, like I said earlier, it's eternal life. It's going to last forever. And the whole point of observing Christmas Day is to celebrate the fact that God sent a Savior into the world. We're all sinners. All of us needs to be saved. We all need eternal life. We need to escape that eternal punishment. And the Bible says the most famous book, the famous verse in the whole in the whole world in the Bible is John 3:16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a lot of love. See, and, and it's showing us here that God gave. God's giving a gift. And his gift, it says, God gave his only begotten son. And, and just to, to magnify how much love that is, I couldn't imagine giving up one of my girls' lives, giving up to say, this is my daughter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let her be beaten and punished and ridiculed and mocked and just go through all of this stuff for you, for, for some other person. For some other sinner, for some other wicked person, someone, I mean, you think about, I mean, Jesus Christ paid for the sins of every single person in the whole world. I mean, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of sin. A lot of people do a lot of really bad things in this world. Jesus Christ came to pay the punishment for those sins. God loved us so much, he said, I'm going to give up my only begotten son to pay for, for, to pay for you people, but to pay for you sinners because he loved us. Like I said, it's hard for me in my human amount of love that I have to be able to, to think of doing something like that with one of my children, God did that with his only begotten son for us. That's a lot of love. We don't deserve that, but he loves us anyways. The Bible says in John 15, 13, it says, greater love hath no man than this than a, a man lay down his life for his friends, which is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. He laid down his life to save us. God loves us. He does not want us to go to hell when we die. He loves us so much, yet he, he made it free. He could have done anything in the world to, 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 as the, the requirements to get into heaven. He could have just said, no, it's by the law. You have to be good. You have to do it. And if you don't, too bad. Tough luck. And that would have been just because God's the lawmaker. God's the one that makes the rules. But see, we all fall short of that, and God knows that. And God still loves us, even though we fail. And he loved us enough to just say, you know what? The ultimate gift, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came and paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world. And it's free. And all he says is, I just, just want you, in order to receive it, just believe me. Believe me. I gave you my word. I gave you my son. My son came. He, he performed all these miracles that no one has ever done. He's done more things to prove he was who he said he was beyond a shadow of a doubt. He came back from the grave. And he showed himself. He showed the, the holes in his hands from where they nailed him to the cross. Witnesses went out all throughout the world and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, look, all I want you to do is just trust him to save you. You can't do it yourself. Just believe on him. That's all he's asking of us. It's not very much. That's it. It's very, very little he's asking of us. Very little. And he loves us that much. It's an extremely expensive gift. 
There's no way we could ever pay for that. There's no way we would deserve that. But God loves us enough. He's willing to give it to us for free. The Bible says all we have to do to be saved and have eternal life is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm almost done here. Now, if, you've all, if you haven't already received that gift from God, today is the perfect day to do so. I really hope you receive that gift. Put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Get saved. Get that free gift. Hey, Christmas is no better time to receive that gift than today. You might as well just, just take it, put your faith in Christ, and have that settled. Now, if you've already received that, and you know this stuff, and you've heard this before, okay, there's still more for you in the sermon, because it's one thing to receive a gift, but what about everybody else? See, there's a lot of people in this world, they don't even know about the gift that God has for them. And it's amazing, if people don't even, they don't even realize that there is such a thing as a free gift that's eternal life. I mean, something that, because I'll tell you what, the vast majority of people, because I go out and I talk to people every single week, multiple times a week sometimes, I'll go out and I talk to people, and the vast majority of people think that if I'm not a good person, if I don't do good and obey the commandments, I'm not going to heaven. That's what most people think. That's what most people believe. They don't realize it's a gift. It's just a free gift. Receive that free gift. You don't have to rely on yourself to get to heaven. You can't. You can't do it. You're going to fail. Receive that free gift. If you already have that free gift, tell other people about it. And that's the best thing. See, Christmas is not all about you, right? I know we love giving gifts. I love giving gifts. I love as much as I can just to give people, to give to my kids, to give to my family, to give to extended family, whatever we can do. I love giving those gifts. I don't care if I get any gifts. I mean, it's nice. Don't get me wrong. It's the, hey, I like to receive gifts too. It's a nice thing, but that's not what it's about. It's about other people. It's about giving a gift to other people. And the Bible even says, it says um, in Acts 20, 35, it says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that is, that is as true as a day is long. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this is the last scripture I'm going to turn to. Verse 7 says, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God wants you to be a giver. He wants you to be a, a, a cheerful giver. And the one thing that you can give, if you've already received that free gift, now, that free gift doesn't come directly from you, but you can tell other people about it, and they can receive that free gift. Because here's the thing, if they don't even know that that gift is available to them, they're not going to receive it. If nobody has heard it, if they don't understand that God has his free gift for them, and that he paid for it, he bought it, and it's ready, and all you got to do is just put your faith on Christ to be saved, if they don't even understand that, there's no way they can receive it. You have to be made aware of it. And that, again... I, I probably I hammer this in at this church over and over and over again because it's the most important thing that we can do is tell other people about this. You need to get involved. If you're saved today, you need to get involved in helping spread that message, spread the good news, spread the gospel, tell other people about that free gift so that their soul can be changed forever. They don't have to spend any eternity in hell. They can receive the free gift from God and be saved forever and ever. And that is the, the, the best gift. That's the gift that, that keeps on giving, right? I mean, that's the gift. And this is something you don't have to wait and do on Christmas. You can do this on January 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, every day, every day of the year. This is something, this is a gift that's available for all time. So, you know, again, tonight, this is Christmas. I thank God for the gift. I thank God for the unspeakable gift that, he's, that he has made for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for doing what you have done for us sinners, for us, you know, we are undeserving of it, yet you have done so much for us, and, and I thank God that people still recognize Christmas in this country today. I mean, there's a lot of people that are trying to throw it out of the government, throw it out of the schools, throw it out of everywhere. You can't say God, you can't say Jesus, you can't sing hymns. I didn't even hear about that until just recently. I think you were the, someone, you told me about that, that school, they weren't even allowed to like like the children weren't even allowed to sing hymns anymore. That's something they've been doing like forever in this city. And all of a sudden, they're just, they're just not even allowed to do it. It's getting kicked out of everywhere. Okay? But, you know, we ought to stand up. Don't let that silence the message. Okay? The wicked have, have a loud bullhorn. 
But I still don't believe that they're in the, in the majority as far as, as far as that wickedness is concerned. We need to stand up. We need to preach the gospel to every creature. We need to just explain this free gift and bring more honor and glory unto Christ's name. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you so much for being born and taking on the form of, of a human being and of a servant, dear God, and, and all that you've done for us, the, the perfect sinless life that you live by experiencing all the temptations that we have yet without sin, dear God, and, and you know what it's like to be a human being, yet you were able to do it completely perfectly and, and love us so much to go through the ridicule and the shame and the beatings and, and, and everything that you did for us, dear God, for your soul to go to hell but then rise again from the dead three days later. Lord, we love you. We love you here. We thank you so much for that gift the best gift that anyone could ever possibly receive. God, give us the boldness. Give us the, the, the courage to go out and, and share the news, share that good news and that gospel with, with everybody we come into contact with, dear Lord. Help us to just explain that free gift. Help us to show them your words and your truth that you've told us, that you promised to us eternal life and that we know you can't lie. And, um, and help us just to convert people to, to believing on you, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.